Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater, and I'm so delighted today to be joined by the fantastic Rick Romanois, who is the director of the latest film starring Gerard Barclay, Butler, Greenland. And I wanted to start by asking you a lot about some of the research that you did, because I thought it was so interesting that you did a lot of research into comets and, and meteors and things that do tend to come flying towards the Earth, and, and through that discovered how many near misses they are, there are, and thought it was so fascinating that the film really takes that idea and takes the idea of something coming towards earth which lands in fragments so it's not just one thing that everybody has to fear it's multiple things that could happen at any moment and I was interested in how that really impacted a lot of the pacing of the film as a result and a lot of the emotional tension in the way that you built it out. Well you hit it right on the head Mara that's uh was the first version of the script that I had read where it was about the end of the world and it was a comet that was coming to earth and I didn't want a movie where you were waiting to see the monster for 90 minutes and trying to figure out how to entertain an audience until then. And when we started doing the research, we had to remember one, we're not making a documentary. So we're trying to entertain. So you try to find a way to, to ground it with as much authenticity, to, with, you, wait, you find a way to ground it with as much authenticity as you can, but also entertain and take some cinematic license. So one of the things that we found out is a lot of asteroids and comets and meteors will break apart over hundreds of years because they'll hit other debris and hit, you know, and start uh, banging into each other and banging into themselves, so to speak, and create bodies of fragments. And once I heard about that, I thought that's interesting. What if you have this belt of fragments where as the earth spins on its axis, you can have a monster that can hit you at any given time. So now you've got a sense of fear the way that a monster movie would work all the way through where the monster can always grab you. But to me, the real interesting part of it was that this movie really had two monsters in it. Um, it was always about the monster Clark, but it was about humanity itself. It was, would we um, turn on each other and fend for ourselves or would we help each other and become as one? And, you know, being a movie that was pre COVID and not, we didn't know anything about a pandemic coming, you're coming up with all these hypothetical situations to see, figure out what, you know, what would happen when, if society collapsed. And then you start seeing these things happening in real time and it's surreal. It was a very, very kind of surreal experience. And to your point of how you can't leave the audience waiting for 90 minutes before you bring that into play, you have a very finite amount of time at the beginning of the film to tell us who these characters are, what's their emotional relationship with each other, you know, and ultimately who is this person so that then when they're thrown into these extreme circumstances, we understand the motivating factors behind why they make certain choices, even if they seem extreme at certain moments. So how did that impact a lot of the character choices that you made, just knowing that you really only had a few pages to deliver that to the audience? before you put them into this situation? It's about, um, my, my, my rule of thumb is always to make the movie as relatable as possible um, to maybe not everybody, but making certain characters relate to other people or people that you can identify with so that you don't need a lot of time to understand what they're going through because then you start envisioning yourself in that same situation. I call it putting the character in a, in a, on, a, on a crossroad that there is no reverse. They either have to choose the left fork or the right fork, and there's not a good situation in either one. That's my favorite. That's my favorite way to, um, to 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 play with characters is to put them into this moral ambiguity of how they would how how and what would they choose to do. Would you defend yourself to death um, if you were a mortal human being just to save yourself? Would you take another parent's child if you knew that maybe you wouldn't be able to get them on a plane? Could you steal a child and kidnap that child thinking it could rescue your, your own self from a disaster? That's the humanity part that I was really interested in was an exploration of this family who ironically, which is my favorite thing about Greenland, that the real crisis in the first 20 minutes is not a comet, it's them, it's themselves, if their marriage is gonna last and then they can really preserve the love that they they've seemed to have lost. And um, and the shiny object's going to come by and it's going to be a Super Bowl party. And then suddenly everything stands on its head. And suddenly they realize what we all fear when we have pandemics or life or death situations happen. It's, it's risking the one, losing the ones that we love and our own mortality and that end of the world. The other thing about the, the, um, the research that we did was really, which was fun, which was really trying to understand what happened during the last extinction event 
how did the world really um, um, collapse? What really happened to the whole thing? So, you know, again, creative license, but we tried to really portray what a lot of scientists think, um, how the last extinction event went and, uh, and, how, and how it transpired. And it sounds like a lot of what you were just describing in, in terms of character development and thinking about that early on in the script really leads into the way that you film a lot of your stunt and action sequences. Um, I love the question that you said you ask yourself, which is how does action convey emotion? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to that point, when you are filming a lot of those sequences, you know, you have Gerard Butler who's fighting off someone who has a weapon. You know, how do you really think about the camera choices, the choreography from the stunt work and what you want from his performance to make sure that every single motion of it is conveying emotion and conveying further detail about his character in that moment? The, I think the foundation of that came um, really from my father's work, who was a professional stuntman and how I came up through the business behind him. He had developed a series of cameras that were about the point of view. It was a helmet camera, it was the pogo cam, it were cameras that put the audience in the action. So then when you start becoming a storyteller, it's kind of folding all that together. Um, I never wanted to shoot an action for the sake of action. I'm always trying to put the audience inside the action so that they're, they're experiencing it with the character. So then you learn the tricks of camera work that help you and inf that inform your decisions. But then as a filmmaker and a storyteller, you're able to, to wrap those together so that there's an emotional thrust to what the camera is doing and putting the, and the characters in that position. You're in the truck with this family as the sky is falling down around them and people are being struck down and cars are exploding. You're, you're with Gerard Butler in the middle of mayhem as a horde of people have flooded an air base. You're with Morena in the back of a car when people decide to take her child you know, um, to, to, to uh, in, in sake of their own safety. It's always from, it's always about seeing it from the out and from the inside out, not from the outside in for me. And, and to that point, exactly, you know, I love the way that you tend to try and put actors in the sequences as much as possible. And, and particularly with your relationship with Gerard, where he's very game for that. He's also got like a really fantastic skill set at this point that he's developed. So when you're thinking about the choreography of it and working with the stunt team and figuring out what that's going to look like and making those camera choices that you were discussing, how does the fact that you have that existing working relationship with Gerard and knowing exactly how far you can push him help in terms of the choreography of all of those elements? elements for you? It's huge. I won't tell you who it is, but there are a number of um, uh, actors that I worked up through stunts that can't even walk straight. And you're trying to figure out how you're going to put them in action without them hurting themselves. Jerry's an extraordinary human being. One, he's a phenomenal athlete. He blows me away how athletic he is. He's super coordinated, but he's always aware of his surroundings. And I never worry about him endangering other people because he's got a great sense of awareness. And what's amazing to me is I know when I'm doing stunt, when I was doing stunts, you're paying attention to what's going on in the action. I couldn't imagine that I got to build this performance in at the same time, but he has that ability to stay on point with his performance within it as well. So he's the home run for me because I'm able to have somebody in front of the camera, my, my, uh, my vehicle as an actor that has given me this emotional thrust while I'm charging with them in the action and I'm trying to capture their image of, the, of their expression and their physicality, what they're going through at the same time. This movie is a two-hander and it was one of our favorite things about it. We never wanted the um, Allison Garrity role just to be the co-hander, you know, the, the, the co-star that was the man winning his woman back. We really wanted to be an equal two-hander because we felt Allison goes through just as much to try this as John Garrity does. In fact, I think sometimes more so. And, to much to Jerry's credit, he didn't want to change that. Some actors as a male star would want to just have the whole thing shaped around them. We really wanted to keep it together. So then you're like, oh, great. Now who are we going to get that's going to be able to do all this? And we hit a home run with Marina Backroom because she is, one, very gifted um, um, as an actress. She's fearless and she lives in um, raw emotion and, and, and authenticity but she's also very coordinated as well and was game to, to be in these situations. She didn't want a stunt double being dragged from the car. She didn't want to be on the, she didn't want somebody else to be on the side of the highway, so forth. I mean, she was in the action crawling in the back seat when bombs are going off and so forth. And that helps you because that allows you now to, when you're cutting to the other, to the other storyline until this husband and wife are back together, you're able to have the same sense of tension and the same sense of emotion to carry on both sides of the equation.
Yeah. And in terms of working with the two of them, do they have a very similar stylistic approach to their craft as actors and, and kind of what they need from you as a director and figuring out what the beats of a scene are going to be? Or did you find yourself working with them in slightly different ways, kind of catering to, to their styles? Oh my God, these two. Um, so you, you, the first thing you're looking for is chemistry, right? You, you want to find chemistry. And the minute we, we started doing test screenings and the minute Morena came in to do a chemistry with Jerry, I don't even think we put them on camera yet. We already knew like, well, there's your husband and wife. I mean, these two are like, they're, they're made for each other. Then it was to get them to just shut up because they would sit there and talk like a husband and wife while we're ready to film and everything else. And that was the beauty of them is they had such a bond and such a love for one another and, and a respect for one another that that's what you see in the movie. I don't think that stuff gets faked. I don't think that's a performance. I think that has to be innate in what's going on in front of the lens. And I think it, you see that and you look at the history of great pairs that there was a bond with them. There was a chemistry. And sometimes it's two male stars that worked a lot together, like uh, Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Sometimes it's a, a man and a woman. Sometimes it's two women like Thelma and Louise. You're looking for partners that are in front of the camera that have that respect and that chemistry and that connection with each other. I don't think it's something that can just be faked. And I think that's why Greenland gets carried so well is because of the emotional journey of what Jerry and Morena bring to the equation. And even the emotional journey that Gerard's character goes on is really interesting because you really lean into the idea of male fallibility, which isn't something that's always explored, mm -hmm. particularly in this genre of filmmaking. And it's not something where it's just, you know, his dynamic with his wife, how he feels as a dad, how he feels like he hasn't lived up to his own expectations in certain ways. You really kind of find it in a lot of the action moments and a lot of the smaller moments as well. So how did you think about the way that you wanted to thread that into his character throughout the entire film and not just make it something that that was in the moments where he's directly with his family? It, it started on Angel Has Fallen. Um, what I really found about Jerry, which was great, is we talked a lot about the movies that we love and the danger that a lot of our films now are coming up with characters that are 10 feet tall and bulletproof and they're impervious to pain. They have no flaws. There's no, there's no nuance left with anymore, right? And we wanted to get back to what the 70s and the 80s and even the late 60s gave us where people, they had real flaws. They were human. We related to them. They weren't perfect. And, you know, we made Mike Bang a pill popping guy with concussions and everything else and a lot of aspects of frailty that he was dealing with in his life. And so when we read Greenland and fell in love with it, it was interesting to take away any of the lipstick of a Secret Service agent, special skill sets, all of that, and just show a mortal man that is atoning for sins that he has caused and failing in a marriage um, and trying to own up to that and live up to that um, and, and find redemption in it. And the, and, and being honest in all the emotional moments, that's what I love about Jerry is Jerry is a very macho man um, who has tremendous strength and people know him from 300 and they know this kind of big machismo um, part of him, but he's a very sensitive, grounded human being that's not afraid to be vulnerable and to let people know, you know, where his thoughts are and what he's feeling. I think that comes across the camera and you get somebody that you endear for and you love because there's, there's empathy and sympathy with him because he comes from a very honest place. And then some of the scenes I was really interested in what it requires from you in terms of the multitude of skill sets that you have to bring to the table are some of those bigger sequences. So if we think about the moment where, you know, this family are on the military base and they're trying to get on the plane and, you know, there's there's so many different things that are happening in that scene. You're not only commanding a really intimate portrayal of a family, whether they're together or the scenes where they're by themselves, there's also a lot of action happening. You're also managing a huge number of supporting and background actors who all need to be on the same page in terms of what they're delivering. So how do you take all those different threads and, and types of tones and pacing and beats within a singular scene and really work to corral and pull it together and into what you've ended up with? It's one, always rooting what you're doing in emotion. How is it emotional? How does it connect the story? How does it repel the story? And let the visceral nature live from there. But the interesting thing about the sequence that you just um, spoke about is my favorite part is that 90 to 95% of the people in front of the camera are real and never been in front of camera before. 90% of the Air Corps, men and women, were all real US Air Force. Most of the people that were at the gates and running on the, on the tarmac and 
you know, and fighting desperation and being in those situations were family members from Warner Robins, the, the local citizens. So then it's fun because you're not dealing with a movie professional, you're dealing with real people. And so your job is to let them understand that treat the situation real, treat it like it was a real world thing. How would you be in this point? Take care of one another. If somebody falls, make sure they're okay. And, you know, there's a way of just conveying and communicating with people where my favorite thing, um, my movie Shot Caller, you know, we did a riot with 200 inmates on a yard and 180 of them are real. They're real gangsters and blacks, Mexicans, whites, and different races. And they would fight like they were to the death. And then we would yell cut and they would pick each other up and dust each other off. And they had a great time. And I think that's the key to everything for me is to treat everybody with respect, make them a part of the process so that when you have something as chaotic as the Air Force Base in Greenland, that everybody can feel a part of it and bring, bring their wares to the table and make it that emotional journey we want. If somebody's laughing in the background and not taking it seriously, your, your shot is dead. And I think that the interesting thing about it is that everybody understood what they were making and they felt a sense of purpose about it. I'm also really interested in the music composition in the film because it mm. does such a good job at really drawing you in on those smaller, quieter, more intimate moments. But then it's also used as a tool to create a real experiential feel on some of the larger sequences. So so what, what were kind of the specifics of what you really wanted to be able to convey and how you wanted to evolve the scenes with the addition of all that music composition? This is the second movie I've done with David Buckley. Um, we did Angel Has Fallen together. And Again, you know, we've talked about my mantra of trying to have an emotional connection to the action that is going on. And what I love about Buckley is he understands that so that we're never writing music or the score just for the sake of action or just for the sake of pace. It's, I remember always watching the first cut of, my, of a movie that I'm doing. Um, and I always sit down and just think, how does it make me feel in every scene? What am I, what am I feeling? What is trying to be conveyed here so that I feel like I know what, what the thrust is of the movie and then the score becomes a part of that, right? It becomes a part of the DNA of making an audience feel an emotion or support without driving it. And that's the beauty of somebody like David Buckley who can be very elegant, but you know, very muscular at the same time. And then there, you know, I think with any of these movies, you know, uh, my, my job priority number one is to entertain, right? I want to, I want to entertain. If I'm going to ask you to, you know, to spend money, you know, and like, is this buy a Blu-ray on February 9th, you know, to go watch this movie and invest your money in it. I'm hoping I'm going to give you a big form of entertainment. That's a, a great part of an escapism and a huge thrill ride, but also that it has an emotional core to it, that it has something to say that doesn't beat you over the head with a message but it has something to say. So you finish the movie and you think about, God, what would I have done in that situation? How would I have survived? Oh my God, let me look up the near earth objects. Oh my God, they're happening all the time. It's just about creating a, a way for people to escape and have a great ride, but at the same time, have a connection to what they're watching. So there's an emotional, there's emotional value in it. And then lastly, I wanted to ask you about in terms of when you're creating the overall pacing and tension, there's a lot of interesting choices in when and where you show the audience, you know, what you're describing as like the monster of like these falling fragments that are coming down in the sky. And even just thinking about there's moments where we see things set on fire on the side of the road, but that's not every single moment. There's a lot of moments where you really utilize the audience's imagination and the implied idea of what's going on through some of the dialogue or through some of the character movements, the way that they're running, you know, but we, we know that something's right off screen, but we don't see it. So how do you determine when you want to give the audience that visual element and when you really want to feed into their imagination and let them do the work? You know, it's fun because a, a lot of people will just say, well, that's because it's the lack of money and because you don't have the hundred million dollars to spend on having something every given moment. I actually see it as a blessing because then you don't have the constraints to spend so much money that every single moment has to be that. So then you get to really pick and choose how to build your house. How do you want it to be conveyed? Where do you really want to show off and show things and let the audience understand it? And where can you use smoke and mirrors to go back to the days of Hitchcock or Kubrick or the places, the guys that were masters at tension that you really didn't see it. You didn't really have to know everything that was going on. You could do so much now with sound design and, and so forth. So 
but part of it becomes this whole thrust of the DNA of the movie and what you want it to be and working with your constraints. And I like it. I, I think it makes you roll up your sleeves and make smarter decisions than having all the money in the world to say, ah, just blow the whole damn thing up and they'll be fine. You know, I think there's, it's made us a little bit lazy. I think there's a way to be more inventive nowadays. Yeah. I love it so much. Well, congratulations on everything with the film and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great interview. Thank you.